The three biggest storylines for the Texas Longhorns heading into spring practices are... You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show, Jonathan Davis, your host. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns. We're discussing three of the biggest storylines heading into spring practices for the Longhorns starting on Monday, March 6th. And then a basketball and baseball update. Last night, the Texas Longhorns lost to TCU 77-75 to on the road. The Texas baseball team on Tuesday night lost to the number one team in the country, the LSU Tigers 3-0. to All of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Before we get into the three storylines, three of the biggest storylines heading into spring practice, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see I got the Texas hat on. I got the Texas zip up hoodie on. You know, I don't have any Texas stuff in the background, which has been a criticism. I'm trying to find the right things to go in the background. All y'all can see right now is the black and white Michael Jordan hitting the last shot. But if you've been watching on YouTube for the better part of a year, you know that I used to wear a different baseball hat on the show every day. I love baseball. Might be my favorite sport. And baseball season is coming back up. So I got to bring the fitted caps back out. When I was wearing the fitted caps last year, people were saying I wasn't wearing enough Texas stuff. When I wore my Yankee hat, people told me they wouldn't even listen to the show because I had a Yankee hat on. They kind of bullied me out of wearing my fitted caps. And so I just started wearing nothing but Texas stuff or regular clothes on here. But like I said, baseball season is coming back up. It's year two on the podcast. I got 20 fitted caps in the room collecting dust. It's time to bring them back out. All right. I love Texas. I promise y'all I'm a Texas fan and I'm going to still wear the Texas hat and the Texas zip up hoodie. But I love being fresh. So I'm bringing the fitted caps back out on Locked On Longhorns. The three biggest storylines heading into spring practice for this Texas Longhorns football team. Ian Boyd, love Ian Boyd, love everything that he does. Wrote an article on Inside Texas asking three questions to frame these storylines. The first question was, can Quinn Ewers make the leap? The second question was, can the defense find a new playmaker in the box? The third question was, who will be the emerging star on this Texas football team? And so today on Locked On Longhorns, we are going to answer each question and provide analysis on can and will Quinn Ewers make the leap? Can the defense find a new playmaker in the box? If so, who will it be? And who will be the emerging star Coming out of spring practice for this Texas football team, spoiler alert, I picked two, one on offense and one on defense. Let's talk about Quinn Ewers. And the story of Quinn Ewers is well documented, right? Very talented, one of the most hype recruits ever coming out of high school, foregoes a senior season, takes the bag, goes to Ohio State, doesn't work out, comes to the University of Texas. At times we saw the quarterback that we thought he all could be right with the elite arm talent, making crazy plays, you know, that nobody else in the country can do at times. And then there were other times, more times than not, where he was inconsistent as a quarterback. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I don't think Sark had the best year as a play caller. Maybe he didn't do everything he needed to do to get Quinn Ewers comfortable. Quinn Ewers was essentially a true freshman, right? He had missed, you know, went 18 months between playing football games from his junior year of high school to playing against ULM. There's a lot of factors as to, maybe why Quinn Ewers didn't have the year most of us expected. But now coming into year two, more development, more talent around him, second year in college, second year in the system, a lot of fans expect Quinn Ewers to make the leap. But what does the leap look like? Ian Boyd outlined it for us. So the first thing is Texas has a leadership void. And for Quinn Ewers to make the leap, we need to see more leadership for him. We've talked about potential leaders on this Texas football team, especially this offense, because you're losing B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson to the NFL draft. Kelvin Banks, potential leadership candidate. I see him as more of a lead by example guy. JT Sanders is trying to take on that vocal leadership role. I think that'll help this Texas football team. But I think any great football team, your quarterback has to show some resemblance of leadership, whether it's leading by example or being a vocal leader or both. Quinn Ewers is going to have to show that for this football team this year, especially with the departures of B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson. This is Quinn Ewers team now, and he needs to show it. Playmaking in the passing game, right? I know that seems 
pretty obvious. But as I said, there were times last year where his playmaking jumped off the screen. He was making throws we hadn't seen at the University of Texas in a decade, right? And then, but more times than not, it was the inconsistency. Last year against Iowa State down the stretch, they took the ball out of Quinn Ewer's hands to win that game. Last year against Baylor, they ran the ball 22 straight times to win that game at the end of the game against Baylor, right? Roshan Johnson and B. John Robinson were the reason this Texas football team won last year. This year, Quinn Ewers is going to have to be the reason week in and week out that Texas has a chance to win a football game. So we need to see more consistency in terms of playmaking in the passing game because this is now Quinn Ewers' offense and this is now Quinn Ewers' football team. And then understanding both his own playbook and those of his opponents. I love this, right? Understanding both his own playbook and those of his opponents. Last year, we heard throughout the offseason that Hudson Card had a better grasp of the offense than Quinn Ewers did. So we knew if Quinn Ewers started that Steve Sarkeesian would not have all of the plays at his disposal that he would have with a more experienced quarterback. Coming into year two, it should be a given that Quinn Ewers has a better understanding of his playbook. So this will benefit the offense in terms of Sark having more plays to call at his disposal, but also will Quinn Ewers be able to grasp the offense and understand it to the point to where he can make checks at the line of scrimmage. Can he see a defense and say, I have a play that will work better than this check into that and then make this Texas offense more effective. And then understanding the playbook of his opponents, right? When you understand what opposing defenses are going to throw at you, you can have a counter to that. And I think every great offense always has a counter to what the defense can throw at them. We didn't see that on a consistent basis last year. If Texas wants to be a championship level team this year, even at the conference level, we have to see more of that. And then he goes into some specifics. This kind of goes into the last point, but recognizing coverages from complicated Big 12 defenses. Last year specifically, we saw the 3-3-5 in Iowa State in the TCU games throw off Sark and Quinn Ewers, right? With Quinn Ewers' talent level, the talent around him, you know, everything Sark has seen as an offensive mind, and a play caller, there should not be a look a defense can throw at this Texas football team that we do not have an answer or a counter for. And like I said, great offenses are always a step ahead. If Quinn Ewers can get the mental part to match the physical part of his game, then this should not be a problem for the Texas offense this year. Like I said, there should not be a coverage or look that Quinn Ewers sees this year that they do not have a counter for or an answer for throughout the period of a game. Footwork in the pocket, right? We know Quinn Ewers has elite arm talent, right? We saw it jump off the screen at times last year, making, you know, off script plays, off balance plays, throwing the ball from any arm angle, right? And still being able to throw it accurately. But we also saw last year more times than not when his footwork wasn't great, he wasn't great, right? I remember the Oklahoma State game where he went 19 for 49. You go back and watch his footwork in that game, you can understand why he was throwing so many passes high, why he threw interceptions in that game when you looked at the Oklahoma game where he was damn near flawless the one bad you know throw he made he throws off his back foot and kind of just you know lobs it up trying to throw it out of bounds and it gets intercepted so when his footwork wasn't great last year Quinn Ewers wasn't great regardless of the arm talent I believe this year if he could be more consistent with his footwork and his mechanics in the pocket and you couple that with his arm talent now you're talking about one of the best quarterbacks in the country but Quinn Ewers has reached the point of competition where he can't just get by on arm talent alone so we need to see consistent footwork and mechanics in the pocket I don't care if you're Patrick Mahomes Aaron Rodgers or Quinn Ewers if you can't do that consistently regardless of arm talent you won't be successful at this level of football greater command of the passing progressions and protections right can you understand what you're seeing in terms of the defense and adjust your protections off of that to give you more time to find the right playmakers in this offense, right? Where's the rush coming from? Where's the strong side of the defense? Where's the weak side of the defense? Who's the mic? Things like that are what separates the good quarterbacks from the great quarterbacks and takes the great quarterbacks to elite quarterbacks. And then greater command of the passing progressions too often, especially in that Oklahoma State game, we saw him lock onto Xavier Worthy as his first read in the Oklahoma State game. Not saying he was open, (laughs) you know, he wasn't open, but Xavier Worthy has 17 targets in that game, right? Can you get through progression one? Can you get through progression two, progression three, progression four, especially with more receivers on the field, JT Sanders on the field, and get the ball to the right playmaker in the right situations? And then develop timing and chemistry with the receivers. Last year, would you say he had great timing or chemistry with any of the receivers? Definitely not with Xavier Worthy. 
I would say no with Jordan Whittington and JT Sanders and no other receiver had more than 10 catches. So the answer is no. I'm not saying he has to have Colt McCoy, Jordan Shipley type rapport with any of these receivers, but definitely needs to have improved timing and chemistry with all of his receivers to maximize the effectiveness of this offense. So can Quinn Ewers make the leap? I just outlined what the leap looks like, courtesy of Ian Boyd. And I think the answer to that question is yes. And it starts next Monday with spring practices. The next question is, can the defense find a new playmaker in the box? I think they're going to have to if they want to match what they did last year, where the defense was much improved from 2021 to 2022. I think they will find a new playmaker in the box. And I think they've already kind of identified who that might be. And I'm super bullish on this player. And it's not saying much because he comes in as the number one player in the country in his position. And that's Anthony Hill. And when you look at it just from a physical standpoint, he's a freak. He is 6'3", 230 already, right? Might be even a little bit bigger than that. I'm not sure how much weight he's putting on during strength and conditioning thus far. For comparison, Michael Parsons is 6'3", 245 right now. I'm not comparing him to Michael Parsons at all but i'm just saying a similar type of frame right where i could see him getting up to 245 obviously them being the same height by the time he leaves the university of texas freak athlete right in terms of the build i read an article on horns 24 7 last week saying that in high school he was squatting 550 plus pounds and then on top of squatting 550 plus pounds he was a member of the four by 100 relay team right so how often do you see a linebacker with this size at 6'3 230 pounds that can run that fast. I think he can run anywhere between a four or five and a four or six that can also squat 550 to 600 pounds, right? He's a freak athlete. And then just from in terms of on the field, he's a big physical linebacker that doesn't miss tackles. He's a violent linebacker that'll come down and hit you and you'll lay there for a minute when he hits you, right? An elite run stopper. We saw that at Denton Ryan an above average pass defender. I think that's something that he can continue to improve on, but he definitely will, right? He's, you know, been on campus for two months, but run stopping is where he's going to make his bread and butter, similar to Jalen Ford. Somewhere, you know, he brings versatility as a pass rusher. I think he had uh, eight and a half sacks his junior year. The last season he played as a as a full play. I mean, the last full season he played, he got injured with a bone bruise his senior year. But I think his junior year he had eight and a half sacks. So he's shown the ability to rush the passer. And if he's replacing Demarvian Overshawn, he's going to have to be able to attack the defense on all three levels, right in the run game in coverage and as a pass rusher. And on top of that, I think when we talk about our edge positions, we have some players that can show promise as pass rushers, but we don't have a dominant pass rusher. So you're going to need, uh, you know, your will linebacker, if it's Anthony Hill, to bring something in terms of the pass rush game. And I think he can do that. Somebody that, you know, if he starts all season, can give you four to five sacks, which would be huge for this defense. And then I think the biggest thing is the intangibles, right? People rave about his work ethic and his football IQ. I'm reading the story on Horns 24-7, and his high school coaches are talking about he might be the best player to ever come through Denton Ryan. You know, JT Sanders came through there as well. Spencer Sanders came through there as well. They're talking about, I know he's in the iPad. He just wants to be great. He's hungry, and he loves football, and he'll do anything to be great at football, right? And I think that's the type of player that Texas has been missing in terms of everything I just mentioned, the, the physical profile, the intangibles, just everything at that linebacker position. I think this is somebody that could eventually win SEC Defensive Player of the Year. He's that talented. But I think this year he can step in and fill in for DeMar being overshone and give you a new playmaker in the box, right? Somebody that can make plays, especially on third downs, those pivotal third downs, that can kind of make or break the game. We saw last year where this Texas defense, as good as they were on first and second down, they did not get off the field on third downs as much as they should have, right? They were bottom, you know, in the country in terms of getting off the field on third downs. Adding a playmaker like Anthony Hill makes your defense that much better. And I'm not sure if he can come in right away and give you what DeMarvian Overshawn gave you. Obviously, he's a true freshman. There's going to be some true freshman growing pains. But I think over the course of the season, Anthony Hill will be one of the best linebackers in the country. And I think going into next year, he'll be one of the best linebackers in the country overall. And I think eventually, I'm just going to say might. I'm going to go ahead and put it on wax. I think eventually he leaves the University of Texas with the SEC Defensive Player of the Year Award. I almost said SEC Big 12, right? SEC Defensive Player of the Year Award. I think he's that special, and I think he's going to bring that type of playmaker to the Texas Longhorns defense this year. And then who will be the emerging star on the Texas football team? And Ian Boyd made a really good point championship level teams and i consider texas a championship level team at least on the big 12 level they find a new star 
every offseason. And I thought that was a very interesting point. Who steps up for the team every offseason, right? Championship level teams find those new stars, especially when you recruit at the level that a Texas, Alabama or Georgia does. Right. And so who were the stars that Texas found last year? JT Sanders wasn't a known coming into the season. He's one of the best tight ends in the country. Kelvin Banks wasn't a known coming into the season. One of the best left tackles in the country. Jalen Ford, we had saw him flash, but didn't know what he'd do in a full-time role. Should have won Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. John Day Barron, once again, we had saw him flash. Didn't really know what to expect, although Oregon did, because they threw him $200,000 before the season that he had to turn down. And he was one of the best nickelbacks in the country. So who can have that type of impact this year? The player that maybe we've seen flashes or haven't seen flashes, but we think he can take that next step and be a star for this football team. Our offense, I give it to Jonathan Brooks. And when you look at Jonathan Brooks so far, he has seven career touchdowns and 54 touches. That's great. right? That's really good. He's averaging 6.7 yards per carry. When we've seen him on the field, he's flashed thus far. The problem is he's had B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson ahead of him. But in a full-time role, I think that Jonathan Brooks can be great. We saw what he did at the high school level, putting up Derrick Henry-type numbers with 4,000 yards from scrimmage and like 70 touchdowns his senior year. So I don't expect that type of year, but I think he'll be really good with this football team. And we talked about how this is going to be Quinn Ewers football team. We're going to see more spread concepts, more three, four wide receiver sets instead of the you know 12 personnel, two tight end, heavy run game we saw last year, which allowed Bijan and Roshan to carry us. So if this offense is going to be more predicated on the passing game, like we saw with Steve Sarkeesian in Alabama, then that's going to give Jonathan Brooks a lot more light boxes to run through, right? You're going to have to focus on all of those receivers outside, and that's going to present favorable matchups for a better offensive line and Jonathan Brooks running behind it. And this is a nugget I got from, you know, Doc <laughs> Doc Texas on Twitter. Y'all know who he is if you're on Twitter. Sark has had a thousand yard rusher every year he's been in charge of the offense, right? And so that would tell me that either Cedric Baxter or Jonathan Brooks is going to rush for over a thousand yards this year. I think that because Jonathan Brooks has now been in the system for two years, Cedric Baxter will be a big part of the offense. I think Jonathan Brooks will be a starter. I think Jonathan Brooks goes over a thousand yards rushing. Cedric Baxter falls somewhere between 600 and 800, like Roshan Johnson did last year, plus his ability to make plays in the passing game. Quinn Ewers is going to dump the ball off to Jonathan Brooks a lot this year, hopefully, if he's shown maturity as a quarterback and Jonathan Brooks is open, right? And that's going to give them the ability to rush for over a thousand yards. I say he's going to have maybe 200 to 300 yards receiving over the course of the season. He will be the new superstar for this Texas offense this year. We've seen flashes. The rest of the country will see what he's able to do. And then on the defensive side, I got Jaron Thompson. Right. And there was a lot of uh, great, you know, people to choose from in terms of who could be this new star on this defense. And Ian Boyd mentioned Alfred Collins. I think in terms of a floor and ceiling, he might have the highest ceiling on this defense right now in terms of a returning player, but the floor is so low. I went with Jaron Thompson because we saw Jaron Thompson have a really good season last year. And a lot of people might say he was underrated in terms of what he brought to this football team as one of the leaders on this defense a safety and one of the biggest communicators right on this defense. And he comes back with a lot of great experience. And last year he had 82 tackles, seven passes defended in one interception. But from what I saw, he was always around the ball. I remember in the Oklahoma state game alone, he dropped two interceptions. He easily could have had three to four interceptions last year. Uh, he just made a lot of plays. And like I said, he was really good for this Texas defense. I thought safety was one of the best units on this Texas defense last year with Anthony Cook and Jaron Thompson. And now you bring Jaron Thompson back. And so I'm going to make the prediction that he takes that next step to from really good football player for this Texas Longhorns football team to a star for this Texas football team. And I'm going to predict that this year, because like I said, last year, he was always around the ball, just a really sound defender for the Texas Longhorns. He's going to have four to five interceptions slash force fumbles this year. He's going to be that much of a playmaker. And I think if you put him next to Jalen Catalan and Jalen Catalan stays healthy, Texas is going to have not only one of the best safety duos in the big 12, but possibly in the country. So to answer the question, who will be the emerging star, Jonathan Brooks on offense, Jaron Thompson on the defensive side. A quick word from FanDuel, and then we're talking the Texas basketball and baseball teams. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet does not win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. 
then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drain. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. So the Texas basketball team, I just have to say I'm disappointed. And I think this TCU team is underrated, right? When fully healthy, this is a TCU team that went to Kansas, at Kansas and Fog Allen, and beat them by 23 points. So that shows you uh, the capability of this TCU team. I think when they're fully healthy, they're a sneaky national championship contender. Two things can be true, though. And with that being said, I'm very disappointed in the loss last night. This is the first time all season that Texas has lost back-to-back games. And I was hoping when they lost on the road to Baylor, another game that they could have and should have won, I thought that they would come out with a different effort in this game against TCU. And we really kind of saw same old, same old, where this team got down big in the first half. I mean, it starts off, the game literally starts off with Texas winning the tip, Damian Boss stealing the ball and getting a layup, right? It's just another game where the other team wanted it more than Texas did, and that jumped off the screen. And you built up this deficit in the first half that you had to work so hard to overcome that you just couldn't. Right. And you end up down 12 at the half. I can't remember how much you got down, period, but it was closer to 18 points, which you got down in the first game and were able to come back in that game being in the Moody Center. You weren't able to do this on the road. Right. Another trend that's very concerning and I think is going to cap how far this Texas basketball team can go. You cannot continue to get out rebounded by double digits. This Texas basketball team lost by two points last night. Two points. It's a little misleading because Serge Ryan Rice hit a three at the buzzer to make it 75 73. So it was really 75 70. All right. That shot didn't count. All it does is give Serge Ryan Rice three more points, which he needed because he didn't shoot well from the floor. They got out rebounded by 18 points in a five to two point game. I mean, it got out rebounded by 18. Against Baylor, they got out rebounded by 12. You cannot get continue to get out rebounded by double digits. Give these teams more chances than you and think that you're going to advance far in the tournament. So, I mean, from what I'm seeing every game, this team is getting out rebounded by double digits. That's not going to work in the tournament. That's in Big 12 or NCAA tournament. That's going to cap how far this team can go if they can't get some type of paint presence in terms of rim protection or rebounding. You cannot get out rebounded by 18 points on the road. I keep saying points. You cannot get out rebounded by 18 on the road and expect to win the game. And it's been a theme for this Texas basketball team all season in terms of getting out rebounded. This might be the most disappointing thing to me. Mike Miles is their best player. You held Mike Miles to one point. He did not make a field goal in this game. He made a technical free throw. When you played Kansas at Kansas, you held Jalen Wilson, the number one scorer in the big 12 to two points. So you've now held the number one scorer in the Big 12 to two points, and you've held the number two scorer in the Big 12 and Mike Miles to one point. And your record in those games is 0-2. You have to find a way to win a game in which your best player, you give up one point or two points respectively to their best player. Let me ask you a question. If Marcus Carr has one point, do you think this Texas team can win a game? If Timmy Allen has one point, you think this Texas team can win a game? I'm putting my money on no. Marcus Carr and Jabari Rice took half of your shot attempts, 32 out of 64. They took half of your shot attempts and went 10 for 32, right? In a one to two possession game, that's crucial that two of your best players shoot less than 30% from the field. The rest of the team shot almost 50%, 15 for 32. The 10 for 32 from Marcus Carr and Jabari Rice killed you. And that includes the three-pointer at the end from Jabari Rice that literally didn't mean anything, right? You shot less than 40% from the field as a team while getting out rebounded by 18. The fact that you only lost the game by two points is a miracle, right? While also holding Mike Miles to one point. And then just the effort plays, right? Like I said, it continues to jump off the screen when teams want it more than this Texas basketball team does. They allow TCU to win every 50-50 play and get whatever they wanted in transition. Now, TCU is the best transition team in college basketball, but I still thought they could have did a better job of guarding the transition offense from TCU, especially Damian Barr. I just felt like he got whatever thing he wanted at the rim. And like I said, we have no rebounding presence. And we no, have no rim protection, right? I'm not sure if that's roster makeup, scheme, whatever. But we have no rebounding presence. 
no roster makeup. Even when Dylan DeSue was going crazy against Baylor with the 24 points, he only had four rebounds, right? This Texas basketball team had a chance if they beat TCU to at least play on Saturday for a share of the Big 12 title against Kansas. Now this game against Kansas, you're still playing for a two seed in the Big 12 tournament and a bye. So it's still a big game for Texas. But you had a chance to at least get a share of your first, your first Big 12 title since 2007 and 2008. And you lose this game on the road to TCU and get out rebounded by 18 while their best player only scores one point. Like I said, this is a TCU team that I think is very good and is probably underrated. But two things can be true, and this Texas basketball team should have won this game, and the fact that they didn't was very disappointing. And then the Texas baseball team, they played the number one team in the country, LSU, on Tuesday, one of the best college baseball games you'll see. It's just electric. If you like baseball, I guess. If you don't, you probably wanted to see a little bit more offense than 3-0. to zero. But now the Texas baseball team is 3-5 and five overall on the season. They've lost to four sec teams i think arkansas missouri vanderbilt and lsu and then the one game to indiana so they're now three and five on the season ahead of a weekend series against cal state fullerton in california they lost three to zero this was a great game in terms of pitching 17 combined scoreless half innings by both teams texas shut them out pitching wise for eight innings gave up a three-run homer in the ninth inning that was the difference of course LSU shut them out for all nine innings. So if you love pitching, this was just an amazing game, right? Texas struck out 16 batters overall, got 27 outs, struck out 16 batters for those 27 outs, including nine in the first innings by the starting pitcher. The pitching was electric. Like you said, you, it's hard to hold the number one team in the country down for that long. And eventually they got a couple on base and then hit the, you know, go ahead three run shot to put it out of the way for good. The offense when you take out the 12 runs they scored against Texas A&M Corpus Christi, that leaves us with seven games, right, against Indiana, Missouri, Vanderbilt, and LSU. The offense is averaging less than three runs per game against Power 5 opponents. We're used to Ivan Melendez last year giving us three runs a game, probably himself, you know, based on RBIs from home runs and different things. So this Texas offense has a long way to go. It's definitely taken a step back from last year. The defense has improved a little bit, but it's taken a step back from last year, but I thought it was a really good sign, you know, them holding LSU, the number one team in the country, to zero runs for, I guess, three, I mean, for over eight innings, right? So the defense has gotten better. Offense is definitely taking a step back. If this Texas team wants to maximize its full potential, the offense is going to have to start swinging the bats in, in a hurry. But the good thing about baseball is it's not like basketball and football where talent will eventually prevail. It's about the team that gets hot at the right time and is playing the best baseball at the right time. So if the Texas baseball team can continue to gel and continue to build chemistry, they can make a run at the right time, which is all you're asking for when we get closer to Omaha. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked on Longhorns, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them. Peace.